Okay. Morning, church. Good morning. Are you guys excited to be in the Lord, in the house of the Lord? Okay. Anyways, let's stand up. <laughs> and as we say this call to worship, let us just remind ourselves of why we are here um, to worship God as a church. And yeah, especially because today is also Pentecost Sunday. We remember, you know, God sent His Holy Spirit uh, to us and. Yeah, we just want to praise Him for all that He has done. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Centuries before Jesus walked among us, the Spirit of God was promised to Him so that He would bring justice to the nations. Jesus sent the Spirit of truth to teach us and give us peace. At Pentecost, the Spirit came as the rush of violent wind and tongues of fire. So let's say this together. That same Spirit is among us now. Let us worship God. From heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Sing praise the Father Christ who has read 
us to want to seek you um, in our own quiet place and together as a church. Help us to want to seek you. And let us become more um, aware of your presence and help us to experience the glory of your goodness each day. Yeah, Lord, so as we gather um, this morning to worship you, help us to be more aware that you are here and help us to just sing with all we are and to praise you with all we are. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. remember of all the good times uh, and all the bad times that God has been with us and how ultimately he has sent God has sent Jesus to die on the cross for us and just how beautiful that is yeah, that he would do it for us even when we're so little and so small in his great creator world Jesus, beautiful. 
is knocking at the door of our hearts and he sent his spirit to be in us to live with us and we are in his holy presence so let's just sing of how wonderful and how beautiful he is indeed you give us the privilege to call upon your name even. Lord, your name is not like any other name. Even though during your time there are many people who are named Jesus, but yours is unique because you are Jesus the Christ. You are Jesus the Messiah. You are Jesus our God. So Lord, even as we come indeed into your presence, teach us Lord to behold you with all with reverence, even with godly fear, that we have come into your sanctuary. And so, Lord, help us to focus upon you, upon the things of God in this sanctuary, and help us not to be distracted by the thoughts in the outside world, even though we will need to go into the outside world to declare your presence, to declare the gospel, to declare who you are to the nations. But first, Lord, now, let us dwell in your presence. Let us dwell in your name. Let us behold you, even as we pray. So church, even as we are going to intercede for the world, for our neighbours, for ourselves, if you prefer to stand, you can stand. If you prefer to sit, you can sit. Even if you want to kneel, this sanctuary is just between you and God. So God, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you in intercession. 
Lord, indeed, it's in your presence that we get to begin to really understand, Lord, who you are and who you are in our lives. So, Lord, we especially want to pray for nations, pray for tribes, pray for countries that are still struggling to know who you are. Perhaps it's just because the churches are not really reaching out to many, many of these tribes and people groups. Oh Lord, we want to pray that you will inspire, that you will strengthen for us to go and reach out. Because Lord, this is your commandment, this is your calling, this is your privilege, this is the joy that has been given to us. So Lord, even as we pray in this way, we remember the elections in Turkey. There are many people there who do not know you. And so Lord, even through these elections, uh, this is the second round, they're, they're taking it. There are many tensions going on. A Lord, we pray that through this, Lord, the churches there, they'll be able to minister to the needs of the people. Because even now as we speak, they're still struggling with the aftermath of the very severe earthquake that happened in February. Many people are still homeless. Many people are still struggling to find that morsel of bread. So Lord, I pray, I beseech you in your mercy, send forth your people. Send forth your people to reach out, to care for, with the love of Christ in your hearts. Lord, many a times you don't even need to proclaim Christ for the first we meet. But Lord, allow us to just show your love to the people. Give us the grace to do so. So that more and more people will want to know you, that you are the great God who provided. You are the great God who is waiting indeed at your doorstep. You want to come into their lives. Lord, we also want to pray for the many refugees, the Rohingya refugees, especially those in the Bangladesh. And now they have been asked to move from one place to another and this place is no better than before. So Lord, I pray for your mercy again. I pray that Lord, you have mercy on these refugees. We do not understand why even if they have to suffer like this and they have to suffer the cyclones that come before them just recently as well. Lord, we do not know what is your will. But Lord, we pray in your will because you know what is good for them. The Lord, you provide for them. The Lord, you help the authorities to build temporary shelters, food, and care, especially for the children. You enable the agencies who are there, World Vision, and many other agencies as well. The Lord, you give them the freedom. You give them, open up pathway for them to minister. Open up pathway for them to distribute provisions, your love to the people. Do not allow anything to stop them. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, right now we want to pray for the church. We pray for Agape. The church camp is coming up. Lord, we are all in anticipation of what you're going to do in the camp. But first of all, Lord, we want to pray for the church camp committee. They have been working so hard for the camp. I pray for your strength to be upon them. I pray for your inspiration and also your joy to be upon them as well. Because Lord, it's so easy to lose sight of you in the midst of being busy with so many things. But Lord, I pray that they will not lose sight of what you're going to do at the camp. So Lord, even as they continue to work, even as they continue to intercede on the behalf of the campus, allow us as campus participants to also pray with them. Lord, we know that you're going to do a big thing at the camp. We say this in faith because, Lord, you are a faithful God. So, Lord, we want to commit this camp to you. That, Lord, you allow us to see what you see. Allow us to hear what you want us to hear. And most importantly, allow us to love and to do to one another what you want us to do. Thank you, Jesus. And finally, Lord, we want to pray for ourselves as your children. Lord, we live in a very privileged nation. 
And sometimes we take all these things for granted. Only when we see the plight of others, then we are reminded of how fortunate we are. But God, we want to grow beyond this. We want to grow to be a people who take initiative to care for the people around us. We don't have to go too far. But they are all around us, O oh Lord. Help us to be a church, to be a people, to be of individuals with the love of Christ in our hearts. And not so much to care for our own selves, but really to care, to do things for the sake of other people. And this is what you redeemed us for. This is what you saved us for. This is the life that you have given to us so that we can find joy in it. So God, may you grant us this. And today, Lord, even as Pastor Ming Li bring to you, bring to all of us the word that you have given to him, that God, may you bless the word and allow us to hear with open hearts and minds and help us to apply what we have learned. We thank you, Father. We want to conclude this prayer with a prayer that you have taught us by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those who are still standing, you can take your seats. Even as the Lord welcomes us, we want to also welcome one another. But first, we want to see if there's anyone new to Agape. If you're here for the first time, Emily, you're pointing to someone. <laughs> right? Okay, you can just raise your hand. You can just wave to us. Yes. Okay. Welcome, welcome to Agape Methodist Church. Right? My name is Jason, one of the pastors here. Our pastor in charge is seated at the front, Pastor Ming Li. Right? And anyone else? How about this side? Anyone? If not, let us stand. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another and greet each other. Praise the Lord. And peace be with you. He can say also with you. And then again, get some peace as well. <laughs> Let's try that again. Peace be with you. Yeah, yeah. Just in Kela, we got guest speakers, you know. Say the same thing, then you know how to reply. Okay, okay. I receive. Let's go to some uh, family news. Okay, prayer walk around uh, the Agape. So this uh, with WSCS in collaboration with Agape MC. They are organizing this uh, sixth prayer walk, right? This is the sixth time. And it will happen on the 18th of June. And this is open to both men and women. Okay? Men and women, even though it's from uh, WSCS. And you'll be split into groups to just pray around the vicinity of the church. All right? Okay? So there are two time slots over there. You can just take a look. You can take out your phones. You can uh, take a picture of this if you want more details. Okay? So for inquiries, you can contact uh, Dolly. This is Dolly, right on there, or Cheryl. Okay, so just take note of the date and participate. Okay, next announcement, we have Parents' Day event. This is by the Mandarin Congregation. Who are, How many of you know who he is, actually? He reveals your age. Okay, right. I vaguely remember him, la, vaguely, so I'm not still not like him. Right? Okay, Guo Xianhua. Right? I think he was... Uh, yeah, la, last time, if he has Dolly... You know, ready fusion, uh, right? You can hear his voice, a uh, very nice voice. Okay, and he's going to sing, right? Okay. So, but this one is basically for you to bring like your parents, okay? Uh, especially your non-believing parents to come and just uh, to fellowship together 
and also to get together. Okay, so just take note of this. It will take place on the 17th of June at 1 p.m. It will be held, held here, okay, Hall 1, and there will be a high tea also at the atrium. All right? So if you, get, if you need more details, you can just QR code that here on the screen. All these things are actually available on the website also, our Agape, Agape website, so you can refer to that. Okay, last one, church camp updates. Okay, just a reminder, uh, no church services live stream, right, on the 11th of June as we'll be away for the church camp. And for today, a uh, very important, uh, for those of you who have signed up for the church camp, please uh, stay behind, okay, from 12.30, that means after the service. Immediately after the service, uh, over here, okay, we have the briefing. Okay, very important for you to just take note of that, uh, to go through the briefing so you know what exactly is happening because you're going to take the ferry and so forth. So you need instructions. Okay, so that's all we have. And now let us go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts to give unto Him His tithes and our offerings. Lord, indeed, we thank You indeed for Your grace in our lives and help us to remember that everything that we are putting into the box or the QR code over here is by Your grace. So God, it's in Your grace that we pray that Lord, You will allow all this to be used mightily for Your kingdom. We thank You, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can come forward now if you want to. To put your offering and give unto the Lord. Shall we stand for the doxology? Uh, hi, Church. Uh, this morning, we are pleased to have with us uh, Mr. Benjamin Francis. Uh, I think he's the um, he's here for a short stay, and our missions come. We have been supporting Big Life, and I think here, since he's here, he's going like to say a few words of thank you to to all of you, to to, to Agape for the support that Big Life has been receiving. And uh, and as an update, uh, I think from this year onwards, we are stopping the support for. Uh, we are serving our support of Big Life, but since he's here in person, I think he'd like to express his gratitude to the church for all the years we have been supporting Big Life. So we'll, I'll give you about two minutes or three minutes of air time to, to say thank you. Benjamin, will you come forward? Very good morning to each one of you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters here. I always said that I have a 
foreign membership because this is my home church in Singapore. I wanted to thank you for 10 years. We were going back. Yeah, we can give a big hand to the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to do a better job than that. Why? Because in 10 years, I, I was about to tell you, I have a PowerPoint which I'm going to, I've already passed on to Brother Bunking to say, you know, when we first started with Agape in West Bengal, we have about 120 million people. That's a lot of people. In my city, there's about 18 million. When we first came and we said, uh, would the church walk with us? Because we want to really see what God is going to do. So we, we started with four planters about 10 years ago. And we were just calculating, see what the Lord has done over the 10 years. We saw that through your giving, through your prayers and your support, we've been able to see 1,692 churches in the last 10 years. And over, yeah, and <laughs> praise God. And we've seen over 600 medical camps that has come about and over 60,000 people who have been blessed in the islands of Sundarbans where you can only go by boat. Actually, we started the medical camp, and then we started praying, and God gave us a boat. And through that, we've seen over 700 new churches in that area. You must be thinking what the church would look like. Maybe someday when you look at our PowerPoint, you'll see how, like the Luke chapter 10, you find a man of peace, woman of peace, they open their home, and their home becomes a church. And that church spreads throughout the village. It becomes a village church. Starts under a tree, in a portico, then in a home, and then they start multiplying. And that's why this whole work of multiplication has happened. And also because when we plant a church in a group, we're actually giving them a habit. Almost every week when we come together and go out, we practice OTS, obey, train, and share. What you learned Today, you can come back next Sunday and say, how did I obey it in this week? Who did I share the message I heard? And who did I share my story with? And through that, we are creating a habit in the villages of West Bengal and different parts of India, which is growing like wildfire. Because men and women do not decide their future. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their future. So I just want to thank the church for great habits of praying, of giving, and supporting overseas mission because I am a life that has been blessed. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts from Big Life for the last 10 years, a decade of partnership and family. In fact, I'm excited that my daughter is here and she's going to come and study in Singapore next year. I said, when you study in Singapore, you come to our home church. Agape, and, our, and her parents in Singapore. That is Mr. Andrew Tay and Ms. Cheryl Tay. So we have a home and we have family. We are so glad for you to be our family. And may God be blessed. And may you continue to make inroads into new areas and have new investments in the kingdom of God. God bless. Today we observe Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost, as you all know, was a time when the Holy Spirit came upon the church the first time. So we'll read the story again of um, Pentecost. So three things to look at. First, how did the Pentecost happen? How did the Holy Spirit come upon the people? Second, when the Holy Spirit came, what did he do for the people and what did he give to the disciples? And third, then, most important, the reason why God poured His Holy Spirit upon the church. So we will look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, and then verse 14 to 21. Let's pray. Father, you poured out your Spirit upon us. We ask then that you will remind us and reveal to us also what your Spirit has come to do through us, and the reason why you gave your spirit. The Lord, indeed, we may lift up our tired legs and arms and 
allow your spirit to work in and through us, that indeed your will will be done. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So first question then, what really happened on the day of Pentecost? The passage tells us that the disciples had gathered together in one place. Now they had gathered because Jesus had told them to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, and they waited. But what was unusual was that Jesus himself was no longer there. Jesus had gone to heaven. That makes a great difference. Often when we go to a rally or go to a meeting and we expect the Holy Spirit to come, we don't just sit there. We have a leader, we have a pastor, we have a preacher. We have someone who's anointed to lay hands on the people. And that's something to expect. That when we go to a meeting where we know Holy Spirit is going to be poured upon you, we look out for the leader, we look out for the speaker, the preacher, who's going to lay hands and anoint us, and then the Holy Spirit will come. It's a very different thing when no one was there. Sure, they had leaders, they had the apostles, but the apostles were as powerless as the people themselves. There was no one who was anointed to lay hands, to pray. All they had was a promise from Jesus, I will give, the Father will bring, give you the Holy Spirit, will pour out the Holy Spirit upon you. Now, you just wait. Emotionally, psychologically, it's a big difference. It's one thing to wait for someone to come and anoint you. It's another thing to sit there all clueless, day after day, waiting for the Holy Spirit, waiting for promise of God. But this tells us one important truth. The Holy Spirit comes upon us because God has promised it. Not because someone is around to lay his hands on you, not because something special is going to happen, but simply because God has promised. God had promised these disciples in the church that he would pour out his Holy Spirit upon them. And that's something so important for the church to remember. It is not the presence of someone who can pray for you. It is simply that God has promised each one. Because it says then that they were all in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wing, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now it shows us something about community and individuality. The Holy Spirit came like a mighty wind, rushing wind, and filled the house. So imagine this huge storm that came, and then the house shook, and all that mighty wind was in the house. Everyone there was touched. But it was an individual touching of the Holy Spirit. Because then the tongues of fire split up, and everyone had a tongue on them. Now it's important to know then, the importance of community, that as we gather as a church, That is where the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. And that's what we expect and what we believe in, that God has promised that. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit touches each person individually. Everyone has the Spirit come according to what his needs are and stay there and minister to him. The next thing that we notice is that in verse 17, 
Peter was repeating the prophecy from Joel. And it says that in the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone gets sick. But what is remarkable is this. The Holy Spirit had been active in the Old Testament as well. The Holy Spirit had been poured out on people in the Old Testament as well. And each of those who received the Holy Spirit were heroes of the faith. You know about Jephthah and, and Samson and all those great men of the faith. These were the people who received the Holy Spirit and when they received the Holy Spirit, they were so filled with power, they did mighty works for God. And now God was saying it's not going to just land on individuals of heroes of the faith. It's going to pour out on the church. But the power is the same, that each person then in the church rises up for God's purposes. The Holy Spirit now is moving and will pour out on every person. And he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, in verse 17, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come on special people. He says, even on my male servants and female servants, now, one would question, is it male servants and female servants of God or just male servants and female servants? From this passage, it does seem like it's on all the servants' emphasis then. It's on even male servants and female servants because all young men and old men will dream dreams, but even the lowest among them, the lowest among us, will receive the Holy Spirit. God does not, God does not distinguish between the high and the low. He gives to all, even the lowliest servants, even the women. In those days, women who had low status, but even they would receive the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, then, it changes our perspective of who is more important in the church. No one is more important. It could be your family helper. It could be someone from the streets who walks in. It could be someone of high status someone who's rich, someone who's poor, it does not matter because when the Holy Spirit comes, every person receives the Holy Spirit when they're open to the coming of the Spirit. And so then we have an expectation, a sense of expectation that this person can be filled with the Holy Spirit and this person may already be filled with the Holy Spirit. We look at each other as a person who is anointed by God. And this was what was happening then, that the Spirit of God came and everyone in the room, but everyone outside too, who was listening to them, would be filled with the Spirit when they opened themselves, because this is the promise. And so, as a church, then we need to hold that in our hearts and in our minds. That God is not just giving to a few individuals. He has promised the Holy Spirit to everyone who turns to Him, everyone who believes and whether or not there is some anointed preacher who is going to lay hands or there isn't anyone, God is still faithful to his promise. He will pour out his spirit. But what then does God do with his spirit? What does the person who is filled with the spirit do and what's given to him or to her? Well, first of all, the obvious one is the gift of tongues. In verse, in verse 4, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But you must remember that these tongues were the ability to communicate rather than this, um, this uh, prayer, prayer tongue. You know, we often for, confuse the tongues that were given at Pentecost and that of prayer tongues. In this case, the gift of tongues was given to the church to reach out to the various people there because it says later that everyone heard from all nations, heard the gospel in his own language. The gift of the Holy Spirit, then the gift of tongues then, at that time, of course, I'm not dismissing the fact that we can pray in tongues. That was also mentioned later on in 1 Corinthians. But the original, the initial gift of tongues was the ability to communicate. Can you imagine if it were prayer tongues and everyone was listening and they would be wondering if these people really had gone crazy? Well, even in this case, it was bad enough. They thought they'd gone drunk. But the fact was that everyone heard the gospel in his or her own language. It was about the clarity of the gospel. In our context then, English church, what does that mean? It means that before we come up to speak, 
worship leader, usher, preacher, we pray that God will give us the gift of tongues to communicate clearly and convincingly the Word of God. And so when the worship leader is leading the songs, they also pray that God will give you, give them the tongues, the ability to communicate worship of God, the ability to communicate the nature of God. When someone talks to you as in counselling or something else, a small group leader, and small group leaders and those who are teaching the Bible in small groups, learn this too, that you can pray and ask God for the gift of tongues, not in a different tongue, but in a way that will communicate the gospel, communicate the truths of God clearly to those who are listening. In large part of our work as counsellor, as telling, talking to people about the gospel, of just sharing, we also pray for the ability to speak with clarity, with compassion, to display the word, the word of God to each other. So the gift of tongues is given to all of you. It's not something to dazzle people. It's simply the ability to bring God's truth clearly to the person who is listening. You know, we, we have this, um, it's known that in my first posting here, I preached in Chinese. And that was, those people who know me would know that that's a big joke. <laughs> but you know, actually what happened was this. One day as I was preparing my sermon, I had a deep conviction that the people in the Chinese service should hear from me in their language, not in mine. It was just a very strange conviction. Actually, I told, it took me several weeks um, to pray about it and say, God, don't be, you must be joking. Um, you know my Chinese, F all the way in secondary school. <clears throat> you know that when I open my mouth, people laugh. And so I struggled with God for weeks. Finally, this deep conviction came that said, you go preach. You go preach in the language, their language, not in yours. And so I did, and there are lots of jokes about that, you know, like asking God to break open our heads in a prayer. You know, Ting out the tune, it's kai tam in the toe. And... And we had a great laugh. But you know, several weeks after that, the leader, the lay leader of the church, of the Chinese service, told me, Pastor, the feedback for you, people could understand your message because it was simple enough for them. And it blew the, my mind. It lasted only several months, and then I left the church. If you ask me to preach in Chinese now, it will be just entertaining season. Um, it will not happen. <laughs> we'll just have a joke, funny time. But because it was a season, it was a period at that time when people, the congregation needed to hear a preaching not by some English pastor with a translation, but a pastor who, was, who dared to preach in their language, and that was it. It's never continued ever since. I tried once in Barker Road, my goodness, no one understood what I said. <clears throat> but you know, the gift of tongues then is not always something that is continuous. It is to meet a need at the season. And at that time, the people in Israel, the people who were visiting Israel, were of different languages, and God gave them the gift of tongues that each would understand the gospel in their own tongue. And in our day then, we do the same. We ask God for the gift of tongues, the ability to preach, to speak, to encourage in ways that others will clearly understand. And of course then, that's, that's the tongues. But there were other things too, that there was prophecy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. <laughs> Prophecies speak of what's in God's heart. And they, they come to encourage, they come to lead, and sometimes to rebuke. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was telling the church, about tongues and about prophecy, and he said, I'd much rather you prophesy because prophecies edify the church. And that's the whole purpose of a prophecy, to encourage the church. There are different kinds of prophecies in different contexts. There are those that tell of the past. I remember recently at Alpha, the person who prayed for each individual actually could tell the past and narrate the past of the person, and that really shocked the people, the Participants, some of them, he knew, she knew my past. And yet the purpose wasn't just to lift her up or to confuse the people, but rather the purpose was to allow the person to know that God is speaking and then to encourage or to correct. A 
a friend of mine many years ago told me that he went for a ministry and someone came to pray for him. And that person said, that the prophet said, I saw a picture of a man who comes to office every day, sits down, makes a cup of coffee, and then for an hour, early in the morning before work starts, for an hour, he comes to talk with me. And that man just broke down and started crying because that was exactly what he did. And then the prophet said, God says, this one really warms my heart. The prophet saw what this man had been doing every day, coming to work early, spending time in prayer to God. And God was telling him, I affirm this. This is truly precious to me. It made a difference to this man's life after that because he knew that God was there. God was conscious. God was aware. Prophecy is important for the church. And I believe that each of us who receives the Holy Spirit also has the ability to prophesy. So you ask perhaps, then why don't we let people have a public prophecy here every week? Now the point is this. First, prophecies don't have to be public. Huh? Prophecies are to edify the church. You can come to the pastors and say, this is what the Lord is saying. Do you think that we could move in this direction? And allow the pastors then to discern together with you, with the leaders, whether indeed that is it. But when you get a prophecy, then speak to the leaders, speak to the pastors and tell us about it. The reason why we don't want people to come up is that very often it could be wrong as well. So we don't want people to just to come out and just say anything. But we believe that as you hone this ability, listen to God carefully, come and talk to us about what the Lord may be saying to you. And if it resonates, we then... You know, this church camp, um, the title of this church camp, um, Celebrating Church, um, was an idea from one of, our, one of our leaders. He came and said, because COVID is over, can we uh, just celebrate church? And suddenly that resonated because we want to celebrate church, not just worship God, not just learn about this and learn about that, but celebrate the church that God has created. And so we had the theme, Celebrating Church. And which means that one of, some, one of you was exercising a gift of prophecy. And that's important. So prophecy could come spontaneously. <laughs> It could also come from a deep conviction inside you that tells you this is important. I believe this is of God and I must share it with individuals, either with the pastors, at the church or some forum. Prophecies also give you deep convictions of things to come. And often because life is, um, circumstances are very different from what they appear to be that prophecies then are important, the deep convictions. I remember one church camp in Barker Road, uh, there was a speaker who was controversial, and I believe that he was the right one for the camp. But there was a lot of resistance. In the end, we had 160 sign-ups. For a church of 3,000, now we have, for a church of 200, we have 169. For a church of 3,000, we had 160 participants. A normal church camp was 600. When those people refused to sign up, they pulled out. And then they said, hey, Mingli, you better cancel this guy. But there was a deep conviction that, in a stubborn streak, I suppose, just push on. Because I felt very strongly about it. At the end of the day, 160 people attended and they were so blessed because they learned something about the power of God, not from the speaker, but from upon them. What they did was they prayed for each other. Everyone who had illness, they prayed for each other. And they saw miracles took place. And this small group of 160 learned the power of God through them, working through them. But that's some things about prophecy, that God gives you clear direction and you do it. And then there is, young men see visions and old men dream dreams. Verse 17. I'm not old enough to dream dreams. No. It will come, it will come. But I've seen visions, a number of them. But visions, huh? we, see, we hear about people with visions. Daniel, Peter the Apostle, as he, was asleep, as he was sleeping, he had a vision of God calling him to kill and eat unclean animals. 
Then there's Revelations, also John, sees things happening. Now, one of the things about visions is that God shows us things that are, do not seem usual, do not seem like the way things are happening. And so Peter had a vision. Why? Because he needed to see that vision of God telling him to eat unclean animals because the whole of his life, the whole of the Jewish tradition was that they will not touch anything that is unclean. You see, things on earth are very different from a peak in heaven. And visions often then show us what the spiritual realm, what is really happening. You know, we are very short-sighted. We are also very blind. We see things at face value, we call it. Face value simply means what's in your front of your face. But what's behind what's in front of your face? What's behind everything? What is really happening? And so the book of Revelations, for example, it was a time of great tribulation. They saw that the Christians were going to be obliterated, that every Christian would be killed. The persecution was so heavy, there was no hope for the Christians. And John saw a vision that was different. He saw a vision where there was hope that God is sovereign, that God will judge, and God will vindicate. And that's what visions are all about. They allow you to see the things that are not apparent, the truths that are not apparent. You will look at something and say, this is terrible. And God could give you a vision to show you that things are not what they seem to be. That behind that, God is powerful, God is loving, God is doing something. And I believe then that some of you would have received visions as well. In fact, it says, young men shall, shall see visions. All who are, at least I haven't yet, so put the benchmark 61. Uh, but it could be much older. Um, but we are given the ability to see because we need to see it beyond what is in front of our face, to see the reality beyond what confronts us. And then, even on my, I will pro, so, so these were the things that were given to the first disciples or promised by the coming of the Holy Spirit. The ability to speak in tongues, the ability to translate, to clarify. The ability to prophesy, to know the heart of God, to speak it for the church, edification of the church. Not so much for ourselves, like God told me to do this, God told me to do that. Sometimes it could be right, sometimes it could be wrong. But what I'll say is this, that when we start prophesying, first, it cannot elevate us. Okay, It cannot make us feel more important. It is for the edification of the church. Secondly, then it cannot be self-seeking. Um, we have a lot of, I mean, when I was working in prison, we had a lot of false prophecies all over the place. But we know it cannot be self-seeking. That it has to be for the church and for Christians for, for people to know the heart of God and the mind of God. And then the ability to dream dreams, the ability to see visions. A friend of mine who is in his 70s, this year he celebrated his 80th birthday, he dreams a lot and his dreams are very real. But God gives us all these gifts as a reality. The question then is why? You see, often we fight, we argue, we compete about what gift do you have, what gift do you it's none of those. There is only one reason for God to give us these gifts. In verse 21, it says, So it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But before that, it says that in verse 19, that I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. What do these mean? What does the sun turning black, turning to darkness, the moon to blood? I mean, it's not something that's fascinating, nice wonders like fireworks. and Wow, sun now black, the moon now red. It's nothing to do with that. It is trouble. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 and 31, Jesus quotes almost similar thing, that the sun will be black <coughs> and the moon will be red and no longer shine. But before that, he talks about famines, about wars, about tribulations, about uh, uh, problems. <coughs> the thing is that these wonders in the heavens above are not good wonders. They're not things that will make you stand and 
um, and gaze in awe. There are things that will frighten us. <coughs> and these gifts, the gifts of tongues, gifts of prophecy and of visions, are there to help us prepare the church and prepare people for those days that will come. And sometimes when we ask, but we are living in peace, no problems. Only they also say, well, two centuries have passed, two millennia has passed, and still the end hasn't come yet. But if you look at every generation, every generation will see famines, bloodshed, problems. Um, right now it's worse because we've got climate crisis as well. You know, when I was young, I thought that um, World War II just passed, right? United Nations was set up. Um, Cold War ended. Things were really looking up. It was good, and I thought maybe our generation will miss all of the tribulations that our previous generation had. Right now, we've got Ukraine war coming closer. We've got Myanmar, which is a very close country. We have politics up north. Things are getting hot. And then to add to it is climate crisis. We thought, well, climate crisis will come much, much later. I'll be dead by then. Um, but that would still be a problem because my children, our children would experience the climate crisis. That's terrible too. But right now, it looks like we will outlive the start of the climate crisis as well. But what's difficult for us is that we very often try to forget, try to disguise, try to get it out of my, our minds. The times are difficult, the times will be difficult. And so we have uh, what we call the COVID revenge, right? COVID lifted, we fly three countries, four countries, and I'm guilty of that too. But we just search on with holidays. We try to make life as comfortable for ourselves as possible. We make as much money. SIA staff just got eight, eight months bonus. Things look good. Again, we try our hardest to make everything look good. <coughs> but we know that the sun will be darkened, the moon will turn as blood. We know that things will not be all good. We've just forgotten COVID. It will come. Something else will come. We've just forgotten this crisis and that crisis. They will all come again. And we try to ignore it. The gift of prophecy, the gift of visions, is to help us to see several things. That beyond all this hopelessness, there is a God who loves. Beyond all this celebration and festivity that we try to disguise for ourselves, there will be problems. And we need to know that. We need to see and help others see that this is going to happen. These things will happen. And so the gift of prophecy, the gift of visions, is for us to lead people to God. That's the main purpose of a prophet. The prophet finally points the way to God, but also shows up all the problems that are coming and problems will be coming, perspective of what this world really is. It helps us to see beyond the you know, vain celebrations, the crazy frenzied celebrations that we have and things are good, and then the doom and things are bad, tells us that there are truths that God holds, that God is sovereign, that God will comfort. These things will come. And that's where the Spirit of God leads us as Christians to know the mind and the heart of God, to see the realities behind circumstances that happen. And God's one purpose is this, that He loves the world and wants everyone to come through safety. Sometimes find it hard to, to feel for people, as Pastor Jason was saying. We, we, we see it. But sometimes there's this thing called compassion fatigue. We see too much on TV until it's like, oh, five Ukrainians just died. Oh, never mind, only five. And then we see like Rohingya, one whole, a thousand died. Well, they have a million, they have two million. What's a thousand? It almost doesn't matter to us anymore. But God wants to show us his heart, wants us to show others his heart. God's heart is that every person be saved. Saved not just to go to heaven, 
uh, at the end of our lives, but saved at the moment, even when we are torn by trials, by tribulations, by huge problems, we are saved because we feel secure in God. That's where the gift of the Holy Spirit is all about. I want to close with this story of my own vision. I think I may have shared it before, I can't remember again. But one day I was having a walk in Kentucky while studying there, and I had a vision of prisoners seated there. And the fear was so palpable. They were afraid of many things. They were afraid of their enemies. They were afraid of the future. They were afraid of their job. Most of all, they were afraid of themselves. Because they wanted to live decent lives. They wanted to live lives that were blessed, but they knew that deep within, they were destructive, evil people. Their hearts, they could not trust their own hearts. They knew that if they went out, they might go and hurt someone, they may hurt their family, they may hurt themselves. And they were most afraid of them. And I could feel that fear in that vision was palpable. It was this terrible fear of themselves and of the future. The fear was so great that I started to cry and I said, God, uh, what then can you do if this is life? This is life for prisoners, but I'm sure it's life for all of us on earth as well. If this is life, what hope do we have? And then the next vision came. It was like a wave, a uh, mist coming, and then a new vision came. It was a new vision of same prisoners marching in formation like an army. But instead of holding guns and swords, there was love in their hearts. And I could feel that love. And it was God saying, you know, things look very bleak. Things look like there will be trouble everywhere, that your lives are all bleak. But I'm going to pour your love, love into your hearts. And that's going to make for you. It was a perspective that I'd never seen, a perspective that I just couldn't conceive. It was God saying, for everyone who lets me minister to them, there will be love in their hearts and that will be the army that will fight. True perspective of what God is doing versus what is in our face, in our eyes. But each of us will receive visions that will bring people to the Lord. Each of us will receive prophecies that will point people to God. Because God has such deep love for every individual, and that's the urgency. And when we allow God to pour His Spirit upon us, and we believe the promise that He will pour His Spirit upon each one, then we can allow God to move us, just as He moved the giants in the Old Testament. The ones who were filled with the Holy Spirit went out with power, so he can do that for each of us where we are to allow him to work. Let us pray. <coughs> Father, you filled Jesus with the Holy Spirit when he started to minister. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to set prisoners free, to, to minister, to bring healing. And Father, now you say the Holy Spirit will be upon each of you. That no one will be without your Spirit because you will pour your Spirit upon all flesh. <coughs> each of us who turns to you, each of us who trusts that promise of yours, we will indeed receive your Holy Spirit. And so God, we ask for that faith to believe in your promise. That as it was in the whole, on Pentecost, it will be with us as well, that you will pour your Spirit upon each one. And yes, Lord, we will speak in tongues, we will speak in ways that will minister to those who listen to us. We will prophesy, we will speak your truths and point people to you. We will see visions and dream dreams to see the realities behind that which we are faced with. Lord, we may be the ones who will comfort, who will warn of the things that will come, the atrocities that may come, the persecutions, the famines and the wars, and the signs in the heavens. And Lord, even in those times, we will assure one another and assure those outside that they need not fear because you are sovereign and you love each one. But Father, for each of us who continues to revel because we don't want to think about these bad things, that your Spirit will also show us the realities that are to come. That 
we may live soberly, redeeming the time, taking time to talk, to point people to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we rise to sing the closing song?
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Amen. Please take your seats.